Mr. Chris, please. How are you doing today, sir? Very good, Joey. How are you? I'm doing all right. I, I, I'm going to throw this out to you before I really jump into it. And you can either take it in one of two directions. Uh, is there something currently in your in your house that you have programmed maybe with some new technology that you're really impressed with yourself about? Or oh, let's maybe throw it back to the old vintage. Is there something that you miss being able to program in the analog world of things that you just kind of long for? Um, for me, the thing that I'm most proud about right now in the digital world was um, Wi-Fi coverage in the house was absolutely terrible. And uh, really just getting these, these Netgear uh, Wi-Fi extenders that even allowed us to, to get into the backyard. So when I'm escaping the chaos of the house for a meeting, I could actually sit on my back deck and still keep a call like this going on. So I was really proud of myself because I'd gone through five of those that didn't work and the last one kind of hit the mark. Um, in an analog world, the thing that I'm probably least proud of and uh, probably come up as an example trying to explain program business was trying to fix my back door lock uh, two weekends ago and three locksmiths later, it's finally fixed. So that's much more analog. You really can't underestimate good uh, internet coverage within the household. I think it, I think it goes, I think it goes under the radar probably maybe um, more so than it should. You know, my nine and seven year old have a better understanding of, of Wi-Fi coverage than I do. So uh, it was a good father son project of them, you know, being thoroughly disappointed in my lack of technical acumen and trying to help me understand tri-band versus uh, dual band uh, receivers, which God bless with the public school systems teaching today. Hey, the sooner you can put them to work, right? You know, the better. Um, <laughs> exactly. Per personally, personally, Chris, I, I long for the days of programming a VCR, to be honest with you, when you used to set it like, <laughs> like a thing, like I can't, that, that was a term at one point, right? You say it now and it sounds strange, but you used to program oh my God. a VCR to record. I was the house expert. Like once the, when the power went out, I was the, I was the resident uh, technician who went around and programmed the, not just programmed the clock, but you had to make sure that you reset all the uh, preset programming times on the VCR. Uh, you didn't, my mom didn't want to miss her stories. So you had to make sure that you, you program those times in uh, as well. And then of course, you know, daylight savings time change. You know, I was always, I was always useful at least twice of the year, even if the power didn't go out. So you're right. VCR programming is a, it's a, it's a lost art. That certainly is, especially because, you know, that daylight savings time that didn't update like it does now, it doesn't automatically happen. You had to actually pay attention to things. But more seriously, Chris, speaking about insurance and, and I guess to a certain extent programming it in a way, what what is going on in your world? What, what are you seeing happening? Is there something that maybe we're moving into in the in sort of the in the new wave of, of digital and, and technology that, that kind of enhances it or, or, or even throwing it back? You know, just what's happening across the board. So one of the interesting things about program business or program administrators that I, I, I find fascinating is still how little awareness there is, the size we are of the PNC market. So if, if you would have just asked me 10 years ago, you know, program administrators accounted for about 17 billion of premium. So very small size of the market. Advance to 10 years now, we've grown at 131% of the PNC market. We are over 40 billion. But what surprises me is that we're still relatively unknown. As we continue to refine our, our, our niches and, and really focus on a specialist approach, either by product or industry, uh, a lot of times we're just relatively unknown to the broader PNC market, despite the fact that we've been, we've been growing leaps and bounds within it. When you talk about technology and its importance, even just two years ago, if you would have asked program administrators how they were thinking about that intersection of uh, analog to digital, like your, your opening question. It was more of on the side of the conversations. It was in our meetings with our leaders. It, it was something we talked about towards the end of the day. Uh, it's very much front and center now as to, particularly us as a large program administrator, not how is it going to disrupt us, but how is it going to enable us and really finding partners that'll help enable uh, what we already do very well. So I guess I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, but uh, those are just two things that when I think about the marketplace, how fast it's growing, how vibrant, how diverse it is. But the fact that now we like carriers, we like brokerages have to reevaluate our, our value add and making sure that digital is a component of it. That's, that's definitely something that we want to make sure enables our continued growth as we move forward.
Yeah, like you said, it's an interesting point just on the awareness front from, you know, an agent looking at a, a program versus, you know, a traditional, you know, route of kind of acquiring the business. Do you think maybe it's a hesitation on the agent's part that, you know, I don't know if I'm going to do this enough to really dive into having a full on program like that feels like too much of a, of a commitment, maybe? Is there some of that hesitation? What do you think kind of is holding it back right now? That's a great question. I think it's uh, because of the the specialism in the niche area, an agent may cross paths with us two, three times a year and not your, your regular main street business that they're focusing on 24 seven. You know, they may have a portfolio of businesses and commercial pieces of business that I don't have a program for. Uh, but then they, you know, they belong to uh, their country club and they sit on the board of their country club and they, they want to help place the, the insurance for that club. Uh, that's maybe once in a year event for them, but they need a program or a specialist in that space. Like we are Bollinger uh, to place that appropriately. There are agents out there that do specialize in the areas uh, that we, we ourselves specialize in as underwriters and they have a, a greater awareness of us. But again, it's, it's specific to those transactions. I could also say uh, program administrators, particularly um, the group that I'm associated with, we really have had to upgrade our marketing communications and really how we go to market. We have to go beyond the the original, like sitting at an industry association event with a little table and making sure we're handing out our tchotchkes. We really had to leapfrog into kind of the digital age to push our product, you know, really doing search engine optimization, doing things like working with you and your team on how do we get the message out more effectively because we are so focused in what we work on. Um, I think digital actually in that regard will have an amazing enabling effect for us because we will not be cookie cutting our approach to the market, but actually really using data on the marketing side to enable how we get our message out to the right agents at the right time. Uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic actually, and, and thankful to be part of a company that, that's making those investments. You know, if you had to maybe boil it down in terms of what that maybe biggest advantage is to, you know, really taking the time to dive in, find a good program that's going to, you know, really take care of the business in a way that, you know, you maybe not have been accustomed to before. What's that thing that maybe is, is going overlooked just in terms of, like you said, from the underwriting standpoint, they're just doing that 24 seven around the, the golf courses and things like that. What's the thing that, you know, I think really stands out to you that, that gives that agent, you know, an advantage with a program? You know, so I'm not sure if this is going to work in terms of a description, but I'm, I'm just going to bring in something that I went through myself. My back door, for whatever reason, the person who had the house before me put a mortise lock in the back door, which I think is Latin for most complicated lock you could ever find. When you look at the door, you don't know it's a mortise lock. You, you sit there and you go, wow, that's a, just, a, just a regular lock and key. Well, I called three different locksmiths, all highly regarded locksmiths. And not one of them had any success with that lock. Uh, because when you got into the underlying of it, uh, you found out that it's very different from the standard locks that you would get at a Lowe's or a Home Depot. So I had to do research. I had to actually go to uh, someone who is an expert in that very type of lock. In fact, when I called the company and they said, oh, you need a locksmith, I said, actually, no, I need John. And they immediately when I called and said, I need John, they said, oh, you have a mortise lock. The, the locksmith themselves knew exactly why I was calling. And that gentleman, although he cost a little bit more money than the other locksmiths, um, he was able to identify my problem quickly, effectively, and deliver a solution specific to my need. That's a lot like programs. We are specialists in what we do. Uh, from our underwriting, to our policy administration systems, to our product, to our rating. Everything we do is sort of that like customized approach to a very specific niche. For us, you know, my underwriters are that John. You know, they don't just do, they don't do property and GL insurance. They don't do DNO and professional liability insurance. They do something of a subset. They'll just focus on lawyers. They'll just focus on podiatrists. They'll just focus on country clubs. They'll just focus on a public entity. And that focus and, and, and commitment is built over decades of them continually underwriting it, understanding it. They're not just part of associations like Target Markets or WSIA or PLUS, which are very valuable insurance associations. They'll be members of the association that actually supports the industry that they've become experts in. 
And in fact, many times when you're talking to that underwriter, you're not going to know they're an underwriter. You're actually going to think that my crane and rigging underwriters actually drove cranes in their past and operated cranes. My golf club uh, underwriters, they, it's not just a matter of saying the buzzwords of like, well, you need tea to green and you have these properties. I mean, they're talking about the, the bag room and how it's associated to the rest of the building and how you look at the values specific to the bag room versus the entire property or the tea to green. They're not just talking about it, they're talking about the landscaping, the sand reclamation and everything that could go wrong with that. That's very unique to golf courses. And they do that because they spent decades refining their craft and skill specific to that discipline. Uh, and that's why our, our carrier partners come to us because their fixed cost model would be too difficult to manage to be that specialist. Uh, we can do it on a variable cost for them solution and give them better outcomes and better results. And then our distribution partners come to us again because when they get that very specific thing, that mortise lock, they're like, oh, I just can't call anyone with this. I have to call someone that does that day in and day out. I don't know, Joey, if that example worked, but I just, because I just struggled with it on my house. And usually I'm the type of guy who gets his tool bag on and so it's going at it and trying to fix it himself. Well, I screwed it up. And then I called in three other guys who came in and said, well, yeah, we, we, we don't know what we're doing. Two took a run at it and made it worse. I think it definitely answered the question. I think on my end, I'm guessing the mortar slock is just harder to break into maybe. Uh, I, it's a very complicated lock. If I took it out and showed it to you, you and I would both be scratching our heads. Like what, what, why, why would it be so complicated? Well, I see guitars I mean, behind you though. The funny thing is, is that guy, John, not only does he do mortar slocks, he may, he builds guitars for a living. So it, truly a craftsman, somebody who just, you know, likes to have a specialism, likes to focus on it. And, and really that's what I love about what I do is I work with, I work with craftsmen. I work with people that really appreciate their craft, dedicate a, a, an exorbitant amount of time just to performing that craft. Well, I mean, we got to have at least a mystery or two that remains unsolved here during this whole thing, Chris. So we can, we can chalk mortise lock under that. But I think the, the other interesting thing that, that comes out of that for me is the idea around Programs is also maybe an interchangeable term with the word niche, right? And, and a lot of the the rage over the last maybe we'll say five years within the industry is getting away from that idea that you know you have to be this generalist to really coming into more of a specialist role. And, and that's sort of where program businesses may be positioned to to help agents flourish a little bit better in that. I think maybe the other thing too, I, I don't know if there's necessarily a question here, but uh, just because you are really good at a certain thing doesn't mean that you can't sell other things too. You know, mm -hmm. what would you say to an agent that is looking to maybe pick up a, uh, you know, a, a major, if you will, but yet they're still going to have their, you know, their other products that they're going to sell. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there maybe a program that you see a lot of potential in for an agent to maybe kind of jump into, or does it really just depend on the agency? Well, it depends on what the agency wants to commit themselves to. I mean, quite honestly, I'll, I'll I'll use another example of my insurance past. I used to work for a company, uh, Hiscox Insurance. And Robert Hiscox got into art and cli private client because he really enjoyed going into his friend's houses and seeing what they had on their walls. And then he's like, well, I'm, my, my family is in the insurance game. I'm going to insure that. But he had a passion for it. He actually wanted to go in and understand the art world and has an amazing collection himself. It's not too dissimilar as an agent sitting there trying to figure out um, how are they going to be better than the other agents in their area going for the same group of business? It's a very competitive space. An agent could do themselves well. And what we agents we partner with are ones that commit to an expertise that they find passion in, that they enjoy, and then figure out the insurance angle to that. Uh, and then just be a preeminent expert in that. But at the same time, to your point, you could be some things to some people but you could also take that model and be all things to some people. So you can start to count round. So maybe you just do the PL, but then you can start adding on the general liability, the premise that you could add things onto that. Um, you can remain being some things to all people. So try and broaden out your product offering to, to more that look like your, uh, your core customer. I mean, in programs, basically our business model is some things to some people. But in, uh, in independent agents that we partner with, uh, we do find that they are either that John in the office that just does one thing and there's enough of that one thing to keep them happy, 
and, 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 and provide for their family, provide for their office. Uh, but there are those that as they get bigger, they, they start expanding into the all things to some people. Uh, and that's just adding more lines onto their specific expertise that may not be in the program, or they'll do the, you know, some things to all people. And they try and take that professional liability solution and broaden out to maybe new professions. So I'll just, an example, like I'm a lawyer by trade. My wife's a lawyer by trade. I really enjoy uh, the fact that we have a lawyer's professional liability book uh, more because I understand not just the insurance associated with it, but I understand what it is to run an, a law firm. And in the law firm space, if you were a generalist, you really had to go main street. There's a lot of singles that you had to hit in order to maintain your business as a generalist. I enjoyed becoming a specialist in, in, in litigation and be in my craft and focusing on a very specific niche. To me, that's how I added value in the, uh, the legal space. And as data, technology, online solutions become more prevalent, the generalist in that law firm space is going to struggle, you know, because if I could do a will online, why do I go to a, a generalist to do the will for me? You know, there's things that technology is going, it's going to disrupt if you're not doing something special. Um, now that connectivity, that Main Street connectivity is still important, uh, but you're going to see that a lot of the things that can be sucked up into a technology enabled solution, that's just delivered cheaper, quicker, more efficiently. Those generals that have to switch their model. So for me, a specialist model, uh, even as an agent, I think there's value in it. And again, I go back to pick your passion. Like, what do you like to do aside from insurance? Start building your passion there. And uh, you'll find that you're more interested in the subject matter. You become more genuine to the insured and the client. Uh, and you just enjoy what you're doing more. So again, I'm sorry, Joe, I, I feel like I probably answered three questions you didn't ask trying to address one statement. Chris, less work for me. Not a problem. I'll, I'll gladly hand it over to you. Um, <laughs> well, I think you, you, said, uh, you said the word that I think is most interesting in this whole thing, and that is passion, right? Aligning yourself with something that really was maybe your first love outside of insurance because most of us got here by accident anyways. And it is an opportunity to put yourself closer to the people that, you know, you, know, you maybe kind of feel more... Uh, connected to. That also kind of opens the door for, you know, looking to create maybe your own program, right? Now, is this something that, you know, maybe there isn't one on the shelf right now that fits the business that you're going after, but this is something that agents could possibly look to say, listen, I'm really interested in doing this, this, and this, and bringing this to somebody maybe such as, you know, yourself that would say, listen, I'm looking to create a program around this. What do you think we can do? Is that something that is actually a realistic possibility? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and the most recent so Target Markets is the association that program administrators are associated with. And in that, in that they do a survey annually. And one of the nice things to see were carriers and program administrators alike saw their future growth. Well, they're very optimistic about growth, but a lot, a lot of that optimism wasn't just around their existing programs and the economy building behind those focuses, because it's a macroeconomic play in, in many respects. If you dedicate yourself to one area and you start to develop market share there, it's just so much as about the economy of the area you picked growing and raising, you know, raising the tide of the boat you're in uh, versus your efforts. But new programs was an area that both carrier and program administrators alike highlighted as another way that they see continuing to grow their revenue as we move into the years ahead. And there's many reasons for that. I don't want to bore you guys with it, but on the carrier side, you know, I used to be on the carrier side, um, our program business, uh, hands down. Uh, returned uh, some of the greatest underwriting income for a variety of business reasons. But I can just tell you the carriers are very much focused on this form of a variable cost solution uh, as they look across what they do and what they add value. And they see this is a way to partner and to continue to raise both their top, but also their bottom line. Program administrators, um, we want to stay some things to some people, but that some, we can expand it uh, by not going outside our core. This year, we launched, uh, we do a lot of public entity business on an excess basis. This year, with a, with a great partner, we released a brand new primary public entity business uh, program. So it, it really dovetailed with what we did. So we didn't go too far from our core. We just released a new capability. But that would be a new program we brought up because we had a gap in our offering and we were able to find a great partner. And the two of us, went, we went at it and built a solution to fill that gap. We did the same thing in law. We had a gap on how we spoke to small law firms. You know, our solution was built for more 
mid-sized law firms. Uh, we saw a gap for, for solo practitioners to small attorney firms. And we, we have an e-commerce solution at RPS and we, we decided we could put something on it. So we released a new program there as well. And agents, same thing. I mean, they, as they look at their customer base and they start to see, I have a lot of customers in this space. And I personally really like this space. They should know that there are program administrators that will work with them to develop a proprietary solution to help that customer base. It's program administrators and carriers alike that are very interested in getting into that. All right, Chris, I got three more questions for you. Shoot. And so it's, this one's kind of simple. What's one thing that you hope you never forget? You know, it's a great question, Joey. Wow. Uh, I wish you sent these beforehand. <laughs> um, you know, it's, I guess it's something that I, I always teach my kids. You know, the business we're in is evolving and growing and there's different challenges all the time. 2020 is a perfect year to, to say new challenges that we've never expected. The thing I always tell my kids, remind them of, and it's something I think is embedded in our company's culture as well, is don't forget your values. You know, you, you can always learn new technical skills. You can always, you know, have and apply those technical skills to build business challenges and obstacles as you grow. Um, but if you go forward without your values, if you forget your values and when you do that, it just doesn't really matter what solution to come up with. You know, I coach my kids' baseball teams, basketball teams. I used to coach hockey until they got too, too, <laughs> too good. You know, and it's always that, like, you could always progress your technical skills, but if you forget how to be a good sport, how to win the right way, um, how to enjoy winning the right way. You know, if you leave your values at the door, that's just, that's just uh, something I hope I never forget. All right, Chris, now on the other side, what's something you still have yet to learn? Oh my God. That's the beauty of program business. I, every day I am learning something brand new. Seriously. I'm fortunate. Uh, but I'm also, if you think about our company, I'm the generalist in our company. I'm the general leader because I, we have nine separate offices, 36 unique programs, all with all unique characters. And I'm never going to become the expert in any one of those programs, even the lawyers one. Uh, I give far greater credit to our lawyer underwriters than myself, but I'm always learning every day about how we can continue to bring value in each and every one of those programs as the economy evolves, as the, the distribution paths evolve, as everything evolves around them. How do we just continue to bring value to our customers in those models? And I find myself every day just learning in that regard. And in fact, also learning how to be a better program administrator, you know, just trying to make sure that I'm as learned as possible on all the mechanisms necessary to effectively run a large program administration. All right, Chris, last question, maybe the most unfair of them all, but hey, we're going to give it a shot. If I were to give you, uh, we'll say a magic wand of sorts to basically uh, reshape, change, do something just a little bit different in the insurance industry, program or not program related, what's that thing? Where's it going and what are you doing? You know, um, that's an excellent, Joey, you're really good at this. It's another excellent question. Uh, for me, it's really this understanding on how to embrace the, uh, this digital wave, this, this, this technological wave. Um, we get approached many times by not just brokers or agents or carriers, but we are getting approached by a whole new group uh, of companies looking to get into insurance, whether it be through program administration, agent distribution, or the carrier side. As an industry, it will be to our benefit to understand this wave of technology coming in and figuring out how best to partner with it, as opposed to putting up walls and, and trying to block it out or trying to just think, it's not gonna. It's not gonna change what I do. You know, there's a, there's a whole ton of uh, unemployed taxi drivers out there that, you know, never thought that, you know, the taxi limousine industry would be disrupted, but it was. You know, there's a whole this this industry after industry that has been changed because of the advent of technological solutions that have come their way, and there were those that embraced it, and then there were those that kind of just said not in my house. And we have to just as an industry do a better job of understanding it and partnering. So you see a lot of this insure tech coming up. And I, I actually think it's very positive because you're seeing industry experts 
uh, we're insurance industry experts partnering with technolo- uh, technology experts and trying to develop new solutions. I think that's actually very positive, uh, but we need to be part of that progress. We need to be part of that solution. I also see many that continue to work on 30, 40 year old policy administration systems, language that was created before I was even born and, and, and then telling me that they're innovative and they're, they're technologically astute and they're, they're doing everything they need to, to stay on the, the front end of that wave. And the reality is that we're not, you know, we're still, I'd say behind uh, the technology wave that's coming. Chris, this has been fantastic too. I'm really right there. Joey, thank you very much, sir. This is great. 